Ok, so then, good afternoon everyone, boa noite a todas, todos e todes. Before I introduce Dr. Carol Piva, our speaker today, I would like to share with you a flyer with our next event. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. <laughs> Uh, and this event will be held in person on October 13th from 3 to 4 here in Gilbert mm -hmm. Hall at the University of Georgia. I also would like to share another flyer with the uh, other events of the semester that we are going to be promoting for the fall 2021. All these events have been made possible by the general support of the National Resource Center Title VI Federal Grant the Portuguese flagship program, and the Department of Roman Languages. I especially would like to thank my colleagues present here today, Dr. Cecilia Rodriguez and Dr. Robert Moser. And in addition to the teaching assistants who are here today, Vera Bula, Daniel Ferreira, Lunara for the technical support. Uh, there is a lot of work done behind the scenes to offer events such as this to you. So last but not least, I would like to say that it is with great pleasure that I welcome Dr. Carol Piva today to give a talk titled Rewriting Knowledge, and I will stop sharing my screen, Rewriting Knowledge in the Works of Brazilian Women Artists from Goiás, Brazil. Dr. Carol Piva is a postdoc researcher in cultural performances at the Federal University of Goiás in Brazil. She holds a PhD in arts and visual culture from the same institution. Some of her interests are language and literature, contemporary art, creative writing, and media studies. I have met Dr. Piva through Mulherio, da, Mulherio das Letras, Women of yes. Letters Collective. And I had the opportunity to attend her PhD dissertation defense. Her work is fascinating, and I hope you all have a, a wonderful time during her lecture today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carol Piva. Since this is an online event, you can use your reaction stickers. Bem-vinda, Carol! <laughs> Obrigada. <laughs> Good afternoon, you all. It's such a pleasure and a complete honor for me to be here today. Thank you so very much, Professor Chris Lira and friend, uh, for this super special invitation. And many, many thanks to all of you for attending this session. Students, scholars, friends, colleagues, co-workers, and some of the Brazilian women artists from Goiás with whom I have teamed up, they're also present, which makes me so glad for sure. I hope we are spending uh, an interesting, intriguing, and beautiful hour, at least replete with curiosity and much joy. Um, I would like to share an image, first of all, okay, the image of my state. Um, can you see? Yes. This is the map of Brazil, um, uh, and consequently, the state of Goiás is highlighted. Um, this is my place, and my research was based on trips around this state in central Brazil, located in central Brazil. So just for you to picture an image, a first image. Uh, can you see Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro over there, you know, down there? So um, Goiás is, is truly in the center. I would like to start off by saying that speaking of these 15 women um, I encountered over my doctorate uh, is for me inevitably to grapple with both an absence and a presence. Uh, because I'll be talking about intersectional narratives that hardly ever, not to say never, but yes, very, very rarely they come to be known and seen. Uh, I'm not saying that they do not exist because they do. Uh, I'm saying we are not seeing them. We are not seeing their artwork, their practice. Of course, there's a logic behind it. Uh, and it's a matter of power. Uh, first of all, these artistic experiences are literally located in very remote areas in Brazil. And Brazil, as you know, is even a remote country compared to those uh, most developed countries in the world where knowledge is produced and reach uh, legitimacy. So in my research, I refer to a state, uh, the state of Goiás, 
that is kind of out of the artistic framework, tradition and marketplace. Uh, just for you to picture a scene again in your imagination, when you recall anything or anyone from Brazil, I bet you quite immediately associate them with Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo city. So it's basic. And then mind you, I decided to investigate the artistic practice of women artists from a state traditionally out of this cosmopolitan map in Brazil, a country, uh, by the way, that is geographically shut off from hegemonic knowledge systems. So I was aware in advance that it was definitely ambitious on my part. I truly anticipated that, but it was very key for me as a researcher and for my advisor too. She totally supported me all over this process. And then, so basically what my study consists of, uh, and I'll be trying to demonstrate, it's much more a matter of presence. Uh, meaning these 15 women take art, their experiences as artists, actually their everyday practice as women and visual artists. So they take all of this as modes of self-positioning. Uh, this was my thesis. Uh, that is to say, by means of art, these women communicate a sense of possibility, potentiality, and connectedness with the, the, the art world. I mean, on one hand, mind you, uh, they are detached from the limited frame of art history, but at the same time, they set up a space of appearance for themselves and for their art so that uh, irrespective of being at the margins of the public gaze, they are visible. They break out the special expressive space of art. They make themselves present, uh, present to the universe of contemporary art and through various kinds of uh, cultural performances. So first of all, my epistemological point of departure and return was thus to re-examine what we think we know as researchers and artists, how we know, and more importantly, the responsibilities that come together with this knowledge, specifically in this case, within the art world, uh, the art system. That's what I mean by rewriting knowledge, you know, uh, this negotiation of many displacements, mostly determined by racial, gendered, sexual, cultural, and class locations. Uh, uh, from the beginning, there was such an initial design for the research. It was not negotiable for me at all. And it was, I live in the capital of the state. Uh, the name of this town is Goiânia. Uh, the population of Goiânia is 1.5 million people so that this big town was my geographical point of departure. I had previously chosen those very small towns where I would be traveling to all over the process. It was just a matter of logistics. I mean, the logistics of getting to those specific areas all over the state of Goiás, because I had planned uh, to visit every micro region of the state but then the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic broke out in the beginning of 2020 and I had to interrupt the trips. Uh, when I had to stop this journey, I had already uh, visited eight micro regions. And mind you, all of those trips I embarked on, I took them all, all by myself, driving my car, uh, totally alone sometimes over eight, nine, 10 hours from one city to another. And there was uh, also a primary responsibility I assumed in advance, which was to make sure that except for that, I mean, except for this previous decision on what city I would visit first, all the rest should remain unknown. So <laughs> it was a blind trip, you know, uh, before I got the place, I got there, I would not learn anything of the location, the cultural life of the town, whether or not there would be women artists over there, or if there would be one or zero or a hundred women artists in that or in this or that town and so forth. And another criterion I had to adhere to was 
the women artists I would bring to the page of my dissertation should be those of no formal training from art schools, branded or otherwise. Uh, also, they should not have been institutionally acknowledged as visual artists by any means, not awarded any prize, not published yet, uh, or anything like that. So completely unknown, not mentioned, apparently invisible and absent, you know. And then in 2018, I embarked on this journey. It was my first incursion. Uh, I want to emphasize that I chose to travel to very, very small towns, those places, you know, in the back of beyond, so to speak. And when I say very small, I mean tiny, tiny. Uh, so it was, a, a, it was a challenge, actually. I will show you some excerpts of my dissertation because it, it was very carefully and beautifully designed. And I'll bring some maps too to show you if you if you if you allow me. Um, and the dissertation actually was transformed into a book. So let me first change this image. And then this is the map of Georgia. <laughs> I'll try to draw uh, a fair comparison. Let's let's talk about Georgia and Goiás. Um, the map, um, I, I, I'm pretty sure that you know many towns in Georgia. I, I don't know. <laughs> I believe you, you know much more than I know, of course. And my very first impression is that Georgia is a state of so many cities, most of them, as far as I understand, not that big not that populous, uh, except, except for Atlanta, for sure. And then keep your eyes on the map. And please, let's start with Hart County, right here. Can you see? Yes, OK. Uh, uh, Hart County, the counts, county seat is Hartwell. Very, very small <laughs> population, about 5,000 people. And this is very similar to Crominia, the first city I visited in the state of Goiás. Let me show you. This is Crominia, can you see? Very, very small, like about five, uh, 5,000 people too. And uh, in the city I met Maria Aparecida Pires, 56 years old sculptor. Let me show uh, her works. And this is my dissertation. Uh, okay, that's here. This is Maria Aparecida. And this is part of her work. Uh, Carol, actually, yes. Desculpa. Uh, I'm yes. sorry. We are still seeing the map of Cominia. Oh. We are not seeing, I think. No. Uh, Let me so, change it. Yeah, you need to share your screen again. Okay. Uh -huh. Now you can see. Yeah. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, this is Maria Aparecida Pires, as I was saying, and this is part of her work. Actually, she deploys waste disposal of daily life from car tires to old work clothes uh, as a trampoline for art, actually. She works with raw materials collected from her surroundings she manipulates raw wood, tree trunks, plant life, and various other pieces she collects from nature, giving them new meaning and possibility. So this is cabaça in Brazil, you know? Uh, I don't know if you have this in the US, but here it's very popular. Um, so this is part of her work. And imagine that this, that this is my dissertation, like an open book, you know? So that's her in her house, so many things, you know, in her house, uh, many objects, many uh, pieces of nature. And here is where she uh, works with the, the car tires and that's it. Let's go back to the map. Hold on a second. Okay, Georgia again.
now you um, can you see the map or not yet not no. yet not yet okay let me try again now you're seeing right yes okay the map of so, Georgia. okay let's go down a little bit <laughs> back to the map uh let's talk about thomas can you see here okay uh more specifically thomasville a city the city thomasville not that small but it's still not a metropolis <laughs> where we tend to find more artists uh, and more prolific artistic practice indeed population of thomasville about um 18,000 18, people, quite similar to Yasiara. I'll show you the map. While okay. you are putting together the map, we already have a couple of questions on the chat. We are going to have a Q&A at the end. Uh, after okay. Carol is done with her talk, yeah. but if you if you have a questions uh, uh, a question as she is giving her presentation, you can tap on the chat and then we can go back. Okay, so this is Yasiara, uh, and you know in Yasiara there's a, a community, a very small community. We call it in Portuguese quilombo. I'm not sure you're familiar with this term and where it's where Madalena will contribute a lot. So there's this quilombo, povoado extrema, population, 129 people, you know, so very, very, very small. And uh, let me just, uh, okay, what is a quilombo in Brazil? You know, let me explain a little bit. Um, Quilombo uh, recalls those places where black populations resisted slavery back in the day, you know, and in contemporary times, Quilombo is also a space of resistance, creativity and shared experiences from our sisters and brothers of black communities. So in this town, Yasiara, which is a big one, uh, a bigger one, uh, I found this community, Povoado Extrema, and that's where I met Madalena Sacramento, who is here with us tonight, uh, this afternoon. She's a teacher. Uh, she teaches she teach, uh, visual arts in, at a public school. She's also the head of Quilombol Association. And she's an extraordinary photographer. Uh, she not only dedicates herself to photograph the people of that community, their everyday life, their work, rituals, traditions, and so forth. But she also produces this visuality to oppose racism, gender and class-based violence, and fights for social justice. In her own words, I quote, with my photos, I attempt to dismantle all of those forms of oppression colonialism has imposed in a country like Brazil. So I will show you her photographs. Okay, this is one of the photos. Let me show Madalena. This one is Madalena Sacramento. We were talking that day and part of her photos um, is about her people, you know, so um, we have parties, rituals and the population. Um, oh, this is a gorgeous one, one of my favorites. <laughs> And then for now, that's it. Is it okay for you? Are you seeing okay? Um, images are okay? Cool. Yes, Carol, yes. I think the only yeah. thing maybe for the next part, uh, sometimes when you show your book, we only uh -huh. see like the, this part. So if you could like maybe scroll down oh. a little bit. Okay, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Let's try again. 
Mumbai. One minute. Okay, again, back to the map. Uh, now I believe you already understood that I began to compare very small towns in Georgia with those in uh, Goiás, just to bring an idea of the di dimensions of the cities. So let's focus on the state of Goiás uh, and take a look at Mumbai, you know, very remote. For us, Goiânia, the capital is like here, you know, so it's very, very remote when we live in a capital. So, um, just a minute, okay. Population of Mumbai, about 9,000 people, so very small, a very small town. And uh, in this city I met artist Dete Teixeira. She's a painter. She has fabulous canvases and her technique is admirable. Her paintings mostly picture the city she lives in, so they constitute an impressive opportunity for us to know more about the city, Mumbai, in so many aspects and details. Uh, but she's also the one who organizes women and help them become visual artists. So uh, keep in mind, we're talking about a very, very poor location. The artist told me uh, that most of the time there's no state budget, no money, no material, nothing at all for them to paint, for instance, but they do, they do not give up on creative activities. If there is no canvas, I quote, we paint on dish towels. Wow, why not? Uh, we are talking about this woman, let me show her. Okay, now you can see better. I will zoom in. Okay, this is Dete. Can you see, Chris? Yes, okay. Dete Teixeira. Her house is so amazing, so fabulous, just so with so many many things, artistic things, cabasa and, you know, stones and little objects, artifacts, and her work. She's a painter, as I said, as I told you. So this is a plant, a kind of flower in Mumbai. And here is a very typical, you know, building in Brazil, in small towns. Chris will remember this <laughs> so much. So we have many of them in, in the state of Goiás. And this is the work, one of the work she makes with uh, the other women, you know, these uh, cloth uh, objects and all. So, okay. Next one is Socorro. I don't know if Socorro is still here, is already here, I don't know. But anyways, let me show her work. Socorro leaves. Can you see the map? No, not yet. We see, I believe, is your email. Oh, okay, okay. Stop share. Let me share again. Now you Vou see. Falar the map. em português porque talvez a Socorro. Socorro, você está aqui? Um. Eu olhei a lista, estou olhando a lista e não, ela acho não, que não, não ainda, né? Não. no problem. This is Mara Rosa, a population about 9,000 people, a very small too. Uh, I met, there I met four women artists, including Socorro Costa. I met Socorro, her mother, another artist, and uh, her niece, Nicole. Uh, who is a painter too. Socorro is a painter and illustrator uh, who works with the greatest variety of materials and techniques I have almost never seen together in one single visual artist. Uh, she's very prolific, truly and really. Um, 
Marajoz is such an unprivileged town too, where it's very hard to get artistic tools and other specific materials. And most of the time there's no financial aid from the government again, which makes things even harder. Uh, but then once again, if there is no canvas, Socorro manufactures it. If there is no paintbrush, she makes it herself, believe you or not, from chicken feather. <laughs> uh, she also learned how to paint using sand, you know. She collects the sand from different areas in the city and the sand has natural colors. Can you imagine such a thing and just to come to when you come to her house, you are overwhelmed, you know. There's a collection of artwork everywhere, almost every wall. And it's really impressive and it's really tantalizing. Very, very beautiful. Uh, there's a next one and, and the last one. I, I worked with 15 and, artists, but Carol, I will show sorry. just I, I, I'm so. very sorry for interrupting you. Sure. Uh, you were talking about an artist from Marajosa. I don't know if you were showing something from her works, but we oh, only sure. saw the map. And I was okay. like, I want to see her house. I want to see sure, some sure, paintings sure. in the end. Of course. <laughs> and I thought you were going to get there, but then probably you were, you were thinking okay. that you were sharing your screen, but you yes, were not. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Let me try again. <laughs> wow. Uh huh. Now, yes. This is Socorro. You can see her. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's her house, you know. Uh, wow. This is not canvas, a canvas canvas. She manufactured that canvas, you know. And this is a, a this is something she she made with sand. Can you imagine a variety of color? We have here, you know, all natural. It's not like uh, there's nothing more than natural here. And that's her house, you know, <laughs> again and again, you know, in her bedroom, in the kitchen, everywhere. And many of her paintings. And there's another one. This is a, a very good image. Let me show you. Very, very good one. In the end of the dissertation. Let's see. Okay. You know, that's her bathroom. <laughs> well, very, very artistic. Um, and the okay. name of that painting is Eu nem preciso abrir a boca. É, não precisa abrir a boca para falar que eu gosto de arte. Ah, ok. I don't even open my mouth uh, to show you or to tell you that I love art. Something like that. <laughs> the next one and the last one I, I chose to show you um, is Ilda Freire from Olhos d'Água. Olhos d'Água is really near to near Brasilia, the capital uh, of, of Brazil. A uh, very small town too, very cute, you know, <laughs> very traditional, very, very beautiful. Population about 6,000 people and very artistic too. Um, Ilda Freire uh, is a sculptor, 45, 44 years old. She creates sculptures in clay using different scales and styles. Her artwork focuses on representations of women and pays homage to oppressed communities in Brazil, such as the practitioners of African Brazilian religions, you know, blue collar workers, poor living housekeepers and so forth. She has also a very interesting work on shaping and reshaping, sometimes exhaustively and brilliantly, the image of Mexican painter uh, Frida Kahlo, <laughs> getting to obtain multiple facets and layers of her personality on different vibrant sculptures of multiple sizes. Let me show you her, her work. Okay, that's one of the sculpture, sculpture, and 
very, very cute. Ha, this is Frida, <laughs> Frida Kahlo. And where is she? Oh, forgot to insert an image of her. I'm so sorry. I guess, okay, I missed it. Okay, um, I decided to show you part of the sources and information and images and artifacts I had to deal with to compose uh, my doctoral dissertation, basically to underline that, you know, all of that I collected uh, when I traveled um, to those towns in the state of Goiás was a universe of visuality and textuality I should know how to bring together on 400 pages. <laughs> so then my work begins again, you know? Well, apart from being a writer and a visual artist, I consider myself a graphic designer. So it, it helped me a lot. Uh, actually, uh, that's my job in Brazil. I'm a graphic designer and editor for the labor court in the state of Goiás. So I'm a public servant, it's a federal position. Uh, but back to the dissertation, I would really much like to create a layout that could incorporate that variety of information, how to do that. And not neglecting that it was, I was a PhD student writing an academic dissertation, which means with much theory, methodology and other mandatory elements. So <laughs> one of my first decisions was I will create theories. I will design a unique methodology and I will come up with an epistemology based on these located experiences that I got in touch with. For me, and pardon me, but for me, it was adamantly impossible and inconsistent to continue to talk about Walter Benjamin or Deleuze, for instance, to refer to possible theory of the traveler or the way to travel, to travel or le flaneur, la flanerie, and trying to relate all of this to so different experiences shared with those 15 women from Goiás. So how to do that? How to make them relate to one another, theory and practice? They were very different, you know, as reality. And to make it clear, I'm not affirming that Waller Benjamin are not brilliant, important, indispensable, okay? It was just different, very different. Uh, I also appeared to be, uh, it, was, it also appeared to be so incoherent to me to employ a methodology such as, such as a, a cartography or any other ethnography ethnographic approach to explain something much more connected to social aspect of visualization and so very based on affection. I mean, the ability to let yourself affected, touched by the artistic experience. I mean, expanding the relevance of epistemology beyond the bounds of criticality, you know. So, okay, if I were talking about Louis Bourgeois, Sheila Hicks, Kiki Smith, or Jackson Pollock, or even, I don't know, uh, René Magritte, uh, yes, I could use all of those theorists and critics, a large part of them from the modernist and postmodernist schools, but I was shedding light on poor women, ordinary citizens, with only a bunch of materiality to work with. Most of them housekeepers themselves, unemployed most of the time, as I said, detached from the magnificent art system. So uh, let's think together. If you can agree with me or even disagree, uh, let's think together. In the categories of inventiveness, creativity, and originality, the work of these 15 artists from Goiás catch our attention because they are artistic, indeed, but most importantly, because they are all forms of resistance in a universe we constantly see uh, white supremacy, power relations based uh, on gender and heteronormative personifications prevailing over the poor, the black, the women, the non-cosmopolitan and so forth. So uh, it was a very, a very good challenge. If we consider then that all those, these 15 women artists have never been acknowledged by any mainstream art institution in Brazil, whose criterion of value uh, still favors formally trained artists, 
we can envision that they have produced visuality that instigates new ways of seeing, meriting cultural significance in many ways, including the artistic way. What I mean is visual art as language uh, or literature or cinema and so forth has much more to do with who is privileged uh, within the fields of power in our system, who we see and who we do not see and whose imagination of what is fed by which visual images in contemporary societies. So uh, just to end my, my lecture, I started with an image, the absence and the presence. And I would like to finish exactly insisting on the relevance of presence to think about our cultural performances today and actually to sum up most of what I said here. Uh, for me, it's all about what we came up, what we come up against in life, or to bring a line by the most brilliant Brazilian writer who is still alive, uh, Chris will know, and still writing fiction and poetry in Brazil nowadays. Her name is Conceição Evaristo, and she says they planned to undermine us, to diminish our power, to erase us to kill us, but in the end, we decided not to die, not to disappear, you know. Thank you very much. And now I'll be really glad to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so very much for this very inspiring lecture. Thank you, thank you. We have a couple of questions on the chat. Uh, but, but I would like, since you talked about Conceição Evaristo now at the end, uh, I will start the questions from the chat in a little bit. But I was wondering, Carol, if you could let us know a little bit more how you connected the concept of escrevivências from Conceição Evaristo as your start point to develop new theories to analyze these works. Sure. Uh, Conceição Evaristo, um, um, she, um, she, in my opinion, she's that writer who can um, makes us who can make us understand that writing is a living experience, you know. So it's such a living experience, and it's such a reparation. It's such like a, okay, there are some groups in you know uh, colonial societies. Brazil is was colonized, you know. And we need to do something to bring these groups, you know, to the surface. So uh, her concept of escrevivência uh, is based on an attempt to talk about these groups and to, you know, to listen to those voices, uh, of the, the voices of the, those groups. And then I incorporate this when I'm talking about images, you know, these women, these 15 women, they are not seen, they're not known. So they are trying hard to resist uh, a system based on oppression. You know, I'm talking about art system. And just exactly like Conceição Evaristo, who is talking about, you know, uh, she's from a, a point of uh, the literary system who is like made of power too. Uh, I made this bridge between uh, imagination, creativity, writing, and visuality. So, you know, this is a bridge and based on living, living experiences too. So I visited houses of all of these uh, 15 women, uh, women and I saw Conceição Evaristo, you know, in all of them, you know, trying hard to resist power relations. Uh, I don't know if I answered you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I am really excited. I want to read your dissertation. I told you this before. Uh, it's yeah. very inspiring. So the first question on the chat was by Robert. Robert, would you like to ask the question yourself or should I? If you're still here. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. To. Just kind of a, I mean, I was throwing that question out to, can you hear me? Yeah, um, yes. I was okay. throwing the question out to the group in general, but oh. if Carol can, st I mean, because I know that the Cabasa has a lot of symbolic value, yeah. um, you know, within Capoeira, you know, as, as part of the, the Bidimbao. Um, so there is sort of a, 
almost like a aspecto sagrado of the, the cabasa. Uh-huh. You know, that's where like the the resonance of the voice of the birimbau um, is is contained and and is formed. So I just I was wondering in that first example that you gave, uh, which I love. I mean, I I'm I really am quite struck by the beauty of the work. And and I when I say that I'm including also your own research, I think it's so important and so um, um, you know needed, right? Um, um, so yeah, that was just I was trying to bring up that point or bring up that question. Okay, uh, let me see if I understand. You were asking me about Kabasi specifically. I uh, the beginning was so unclear for me because of the sound, you know. <laughs> oh. Yeah, um, about the cabasa, if within Goiás or mm-hmm. the, you know, even locally for that artist, if the cabasa um, had some specific meaning, ah, why I see, I see. using uh-huh. the cabasa to signify? Okay, I, nee, I, nee, I, nee, I know. Uh, exa- uh, specifically for her, for Maria Aparecida, not at all, you know. Uh, except for this meaning that she was, you know, uh, walking down the streets and going to remote areas in her town and collecting them from nature. And she's very proud of herself. To, and she says that, you know, all the time, this is from my nature, this is from, from my people. So there's not a symbolic, specifically uh, ritual uh, behind the cabasa, exactly. But um She's very, very glad to say, oh, Cabas is part of my tradition, it's part of my my country, it's part of my state, you know. Well, I think, you know, uh, the vision that these artists offer and the way that you're framing them, you know, while I was listening to you, um, it made me think, strangely enough, of the film Bacurau. Oh, yeah. You know, and, so you watch you know, Bacurau. <laughs> right, like the, the, the town of Bacurau could remind you of the size, the scale, and the sort of, and perhaps the socioeconomics of some of these small towns that you that you visited. And of course, that film is about resistance of this local yes. community to national forces, to global forces, and and um, but sort of seen through this sort of Tarantino esque, you know, almost kind of revenge, um, you know, um, vi- very violent world and violent uh-huh. form of resistance. Whereas what you're capturing is sort of an alternative to that vision. Anyway, I'll just leave it at that. But I, I really um, I appreciate um, you you bringing this perspective. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, except for the violence, uh, that's you know a good image. That city of Bacurau, but there's no violence. The, those cities uh, I visited are so tranquil. <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you, Robert. Thank you. Okay. So uh, on the chat, there is also a question by Renato Cirino, and he says, "Carol, if I may, how these women saw you when you started your approach and after the research." Okay, um, it's a good. Uh, Renato is my is my colleague from the university, Federal University of Goiás. Thank you, Renato. Uh, basically, I traveled to the cities. I didn't know anything in advance, as I told you, and then I stopped the car. You know, I parked the car, or I, I left the car at the hotel, and then I started walking the streets uh, of the city, and then I asked people, you know, on the streets, oh, do you know any woman artist in the city? Uh, is it possible to, you know, to give me directions and et cetera, et cetera. And there was not a city where I couldn't meet a woman, you know, um, producing art. It was like, wow, impressive. It was, uh, I thought about that. Um, uh, it was part of my thesis too, that I would meet uh, in every city uh, I arrived, I arrived. I would meet uh, a woman, you know, uh, working with art, and so. And then I approached it. I I went to her their houses. Uh, knock knock knock. <laughs> okay, are you an artist? Yes, yes. Someone told me that you have this work. Um, you were a painter or a sculptor, uh, whatever. 
And then they, they invited me in. It was so cool. Okay, let's drink some coffee. <laughs> it's so, so, so normal, natural in Brazil. And then we began to talk and I interviewed them. There's also a documentary. Uh, uh, I will, I don't remember if you, if you remember, Chris, the documentary. The image I captured uh, about these women, I, you know, I made oh, I a documentary. Remember. Yeah, you showed us. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So basically, that's it. And Renato, um, Renato, não sei se te respondi. Não estou vendo o Renato aqui, mas mais ou menos assim. E nós temos também, we have a question from Daniel on the chat. Okay. Daniel, would you mind reading your own question? <laughs> Not at all. Um, so, uh, Carol, um, you mentioned that uh, those women uh, that you just showed us some um, uh, craftsmen, and I took a liberty to add craft womanship. <laughs> <laughs> um, that entails a narrative of resistance. Um, is that narrative produced by the by the in past through generations, or do they uh, those women appropriate or antag or try to antagonize Western like uh, craftsmanship in from homogenic centers in Brazil? Are they aware of uh, yeah. those uh, hegemonic uh, art artistic? corridors in Brazil, or they create uh, their own art spontaneously, and they create their own uh, history and their own beliefs, and they pass on to the next generation? Either way, Daniel, a very good question. Um, actually, all the methodology and the theory I built for the, the dissertation uh, was based on their spontaneous, um, uh, you know, and uh questions they were posing questions for, you know to me all the time part of them part of these women are really aware uh of this you know empowerment as a woman and etc so they res madalena is one of them and madalena is here so but but another part of these women no no they are just producing art they're just you know they don't know uh, or they know inadvertently it's, it's even better that they are resisting you know so part of them are are declare declare themselves feminists uh, and part of them uh, do not you know do not bring this concept into the surface so it was like um, 50-50, you know. Yes, answered you. Yeah. Thank, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking of, um, for example, uh, Jarija Reis, who uh, oh, sure. produced in yeah. Cordes, because, uh, uh, of course, she uh, she's formally educated, right? And she's aware, and she produces uh, her art to antagonize. But mm -hmm. then again, uh, we have other women, uh, especially from indigenous background or um, like uh, from ag agricultural communities, that they are just there um, doing, uh, producing the art they got from their uh, mothers and grandmothers and all the history that comes with it, right? And the yeah. history is not either antagonizing, trying to antagonize, um, a hegemonic knowledge they're yes. just producing their and passing on their beliefs and yes i would like uh, to I, it was a really good to see that they are producing new knowledge because that's yes. the way to keep moving yes. forward right? yes 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 so in the much. end they are they are rewriting knowledge you know yeah. themselves yes uh, I have a comment. Uh, my doctoral uh, advisor is here, Professor Alice Martins. Say hello. And my postdoctoral supervisor, Luciane Dias, is here too. So I'm so glad. I'm so honored. Yeah. <laughs> you should feel really proud. It's a wonderful oh. dissertation. It's a wonderful mm -hmm. work. Uh, just to confirm, Cecilia, you had asked the question, do you think that her response to Renato uh, was enough? Okay. And Cecilia is also saying that she's congratulating you on your research, Carol, and saying that it's really important and relevant to 
use the space of academia to uh, give voice to underrepresented communities. Uh, and I think that because we only have like five minutes, I think that it would be super nice for us to hear from Madalena yes. in Portuguese. Yes, Madalena. Right? Mada, please, liga a camera. Oh, and Cecilia also had another question. So if we have okay. time, sure, Cecilia. Sure. Madalena. Madalena. In Portuguese, in Portuguese, Mada. Seu Madalena, microfone. acho que você desligou seu microfone. Me vi. Agora escutamos. Oi. Pronto? <risos> Obrigada, Madalena, por ter vindo. Eu que agradeço por participar mais uma vez de um momento tão importante para nós, fazedoras, né? fazedoras de arte, que, infelizmente, não somos é, tão reconhecidas dentro da universidade, que é um caminho que você começa a abrir, é um carreiro para nós, enquanto mulher negra, principalmente para mim, enquanto mulher negra, que falo de vários lugares, de professora, é, liderança, pesquisadora, artista, e neste momento nem, nem sempre somos, somos mulheres autorizadas a falar de alguns lugares, e um desses lugares é a, esse lugar de artista, ainda continuamos nesta invisibilidade, infelizmente, mas você está fazendo um trabalho belíssimo, porque é um grande começo para nós. Estamos juntas. Estamos juntas, Madá. <risos> Parabéns, Madalena, as fotos são belíssimas, que trabalho. É uma alegria tê-la aqui conosco hoje também, um privilégio escutar da própria artista. Agora, você... Madalena, você podia contar para a gente o outro lado da moeda, né? Porque nós tivemos o ponto de vista da Carol, que, ah, eu cheguei nessas cidades e encontrei essas artistas. Como foi estar na sua casa como artista e receber a, a, a Carol, né? Como pesquisadora, assim, do, absolutamente do nada. Então, foi um encontro porque a Carol esteve em minha casa, e quem chega na minha casa não chega por acaso. Vem alguém guiando nesses caminhos da vida, e foi um encontro. E a partir do momento que nós conversamos, bem outros assuntos, nós encontramos nessas conversas e finalizamos com as fotografias. Antes eu já tinha mostrado os meus trabalhos manuais. Deixa Uh, acho que travou. Acho que um deu pouco. uma travada. É. É, é, o povoado extremo é um povoado que fica perto de Aciara, né, que é a cidade é, que é próxima, assim, referência, mas é um povoado que é de difícil acesso, assim, é estrada de terra. Então, isso, essa é uma imagem dos povo, assim, de alguns povoados também, sabe? E é um povoado muito organizado e, de repente, estava a Madalena lá. Na verdade, nesses percursos, eu chegava na cidade, às vezes algumas artistas me falavam Ah, você já conheceu a fulana de tal? E a Madalena foi mais ou menos assim Eu encontrei é, a Dete Teixeira, que é super fã do trabalho da Madá E ela falou, você não pode ir embora, eu já estava com viagem programada para ir embora Para o outro extremo do estado Ela falou para mim, você não pode ir embora sem conhecer a Madalena <risos> E depois foi uma grande surpresa Seu microfone, Madá que bom. Ah, Aí. retornamos. Pronto. E, Cecília, você não quer aproveitar essa oportunidade de fazer a pergunta que você tinha para a Madalena? <risos> Olá. Eu queria falar muito rapidamente que eu estou, nossa, muito emocionada e eu queria só parabenizar todas essas mulheres maravilhosas. É uma linhagem inteira, né? Orientadora, orientanda... <risos> E as artistas incríveis, parabéns, Madalena, parabéns mesmo. É, eu queria perguntar como a arte surgiu na sua vida. Uma pergunta muito simples, mas ao mesmo tempo acho que muito complexa de responder, né? E como que foi a Carol batendo na sua porta, essa pessoa chegando? Mas acho que você já comentou um pouco isso, né? Eu tinha a mesma curiosidade. Então, eu nasci artista. 
Eu aprendi a desenhar. Desde criança eu desenhei o meu mundo. E, infelizmente, na escola eu não encontrei a arte. Eu encontrei um mundo de palavras. Palavras que não é, me contemplavam. E eu seguia esse caminho desenhando. Depois passei pela Faculdade de Artes Visuais, UFG. Mas, infelizmente, não foi um encontro, porque eu não tive um autorreferencial na arte. Uma universidade federal, mas elitista, eurocêntrica. E ali eu não encontrei a arte que eu procurava. E segui meu caminho. Parei né, em performances culturais, onde eu pude falar do meu povo. Um povo invisibilizado, mas che chegamos é, a esse momento de vez e voz por meio da pesquisa. Uma pesquisanda, é, deixa, é, saindo desse lugar de pesquisanda para pesquisadora. Então, eu continuei com a arte, mas não no desenho. Hoje eu já não desenho, eu desenho, mas não gosto de desenhar como eu desenhava antes. Antes eu devorava. Era dois, dia, dois desenhos por dia. Era algo bem, assim, que me alimentava todos os dias. Hoje é a fotografia. Eu registro tudo na minha comunidade. Eu tenho fotos de, de pessoas que, infelizmente, já tem um ano, um ano que nós perdemos aqui, nesse período pandêmico, que é um período é, de luto no mundo, e principalmente para mim. E nessa noite a Carol trouxe algumas imagens é, de algumas mulheres que estava comigo no ano passado e agora não está. Então são grandes perdas e esses registros agora, eles passam a ser mais importante ainda para mim para o meu povo. Porque fala das nossas vivências e são vivências que, que estão sendo registradas e está sendo no mostrada o nosso modo de vida, que é um modo de vida simples, mas honesto, não somos os marginais como fomos marginalizados, não somos subalternos como fomos subalternizados, nós pensamos, nós temos a arte, nós temos é, a medicina, que um dia foi invisibilizada também, a parteira, a parteira, minha madrinha, aquela que sustentou a comunidade negra por décadas. Então, isso chega um momento que todo esse conhecimento está adentrando a universidade e por nós, quilombolas. E acredito que as imagens, elas falam muito por nós. Essas imagens chegaram até vocês, George, eu não pensei que chegaria. <risos> Então, elas, elas, elas estão aí. Elas estão adentrando a um espaço que disseram para nós que não era nosso. Elas estão para o mundo. E, para mim, é uma grande honra fazer parte deste trabalho que a Carol faz e chegar até vocês, poder dialogar em uma noite para nós aqui no Brasil. Né? Eu nem sei direito se vocês é dia, se é noite. Eu não... Agora <risos> já é noite também, Madalena, para a gente. São, ah, é? seis e... São 18 horas e 30 minutos aqui. Agora ah, que a gente que chegou no futuro, onde você estava uma hora atrás. <risos> <risos> Madalena, é um privilégio para a gente recebê-la. Que alegria escutá-la. E o Daniel tem um comentário que eu vou deixar que ele mesmo faça. Esse povo está com vergonha de falar. Eu tenho que ficar servindo de ponte. Então, eu estava uh, ouvindo a fala da, da Madalena dizendo que na época uh, de escola não tinha um referencial. Mas é bom ver que hoje o referencial é ela. Né? E que as próximas gerações já não vão uh, falar que não havia um referencial. Porque o referencial é, é ela. E é muito bom ver esse processo. Por exemplo, a Carol falou, mostrou o mapa da Geórgia, mostrando as cidades para comparar com o tamanho das cidades no Brasil. E uh, se a gente uh, for pensar um pouco uh, sobre Alice Walker, né, uh, 
Ela é de uma cidade de Eaton, que é um, uma cidade minúscula. Minúscula. E uma Carol foi lá e descobriu uma Madalena que <risos> hoje é conhecida no mundo todo. Então, é muito bom ver os bastidores dessas descobertas também. Então, é um trabalho muito, uh, muito uh, sensível, não é? Uh, é um trabalho muito importante de uma magnitude imensa. Uh, e eu só tenho a agradecer uh, pela, sua, pela fala de vocês e compartilhar esses bastidores, né, que a gente às vezes não vê, passa despercebido. Obrigado. Obrigada, Daniela. Eu vou pedir, então, Carol, que você tenha aí suas últimas palavras para que a gente possa encerrar, porque a gente já está cinco minutos aí atrasadas. E dizer mais uma vez, obrigada, Carol, obrigada, Maria Madalena, foi um prazer recebê-las. É, foi muito interessante, foi muito intrigante o trabalho, né, do, por todo o doutorado. É, esse é um trabalho da minha orientadora, só que no âmbito do cinema, ela viaja pelo interior também, é, à procura de fazedores de cinema, eu acho que ela ainda está aqui, né, Alice? É, e aí, bom, por que não pensar em fazedoras? Eu fui pensando nessas fazedoras, mulheres, artistas, eu venho do campo das artes visuais, e aí, como a Cris lembrou, só tinha uma forma de abordar essas mulheres, que era pela, pela, pelas visuais vivências, né? É, é, que é um conceito muito próximo da, do da Conceição Evaristo, né? de reparação, na verdade. A gente está falando aqui de legitimidade de reparação. Né? É, e aí foi maravilhoso, foi um trabalho maravilhoso. Eu sei que muitos estudantes e muitas é, sofrem durante o doutorado, e eu não sofri durante o doutorado, foi muito bom. Não sofri, eu brincava com a Alice, não sofri. E agora no pós-doc, eu estou trabalhando com a Luciene, as teóricas vivências. Então, eu vou continuar nesse âmbito, porque a gente pensa né, em teorias e teorias que explicam o quê? A própria Madalena disse, as teorias, as epistemologias não explicam nada da gente. E aí, então, eu vou pensar nessas teóricas vivências que não podem ser apartadas da realidade, né, do, do dia a dia. E é um prazer falar para vocês, né? foi um prazer falar em inglês, é um prazer falar em português. Eu vou disponibilizar, viu, Cris, a tese, o link depois para você repassar para o Daniel, para a Cecília, para todo mundo, e o documentário, o documentário também. Muito obrigada por me receberem. E me chamem sempre, vou chamar a Madalena para vir aqui mostrar as imagens, as novas imagens dela. Obrigada, gente. Uma alegria. É, Carol, só queria dizer uma coisa, eu estava olhando aqui no chat de novo e me escapou um comentário. Virnin, você Por quer favor. falar rapidinho sobre... Ah, me, me perdoa, me escapou. Imagina, é só uma curiosidade. Uhum. Eu conheço bastante Olhos d'Água. É, minha família passou muito tempo por lá, meu avô tinha fazenda lá, minha mãe tinha fazenda pela região. E é uma cidade, de fato, que é muito curiosa, né? de bastante produção artística, de muito Sim. artesanato. É, e a curiosidade que eu ia compartilhar é que o Tratado de Tordesilhas passava pela, por essa cidade, né? E hoje é uma das cidade, é uma cidade pequena do interior de 6 mil habitantes, mas com o um, um centro histórico muito preservado, assim, né? Com ótimos restaurantes, enfim. É. E é uma cidade pequena, mas tão adorável, tão cheia de riqueza. Né? Onde acontece a Feira do Troca, que é, é. bastante famosa também oh. pelas pessoas que moram em Brasília e pela região. Que legal, Virne. Obrigada. Uhum. Bom, então agora, obrigada a todos, boa noite e voltem, sim, para uma próxima oportunidade os outros eventos que nós temos aí online.